How do I find better clients? How do I find better clients? He says the better question is, how do better clients find you? So think about that for a second. How do better clients find you? Are you easy to find? I mean, just do this exercise in your mind or your notebook right now. Write down the top three ways that somebody's going to find you. And it's going to be difficult. I know it's going to be really difficult. And the top three will be referral, 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 and then word of mouth. You make it really hard to find you, and I include myself in this group. Don't make it hard to find you. OK, so now how is somebody going to find you in the 21st century? They're going to type something in Google, I think. There's two ways they're going to find you, right? You've you got a pop-up ad somewhere, or they see something. They read an article somewhere. They see you on TV, which you're not going to be on. Or they're going to type in something. Think about the search phrase, keywords, or string somebody's going to type in to find you. Amy, what do you do? I do branding for creative businesses. Branding for creative businesses. So if somebody typed in branding for creative businesses, would you show up on Google? No. What would show up? Do you know? I don't know. That's what, that's what you guys should do. You should get on it right now, whenever you want. Type in what it is that you think somebody's going to look for. This is how people are finding you right now. And the way this works is, at least the way I understand that Google works, is the more things that point to you with that same word, the better you are going to do in the rankings. We also know that if you have on your page a piece of video that's related to that same search string, you have a much higher chance. So what we want to do is to make it easy for our clients to find us. So creative people, and I've, I've dealt with this, I've asked everybody in the company, be more active in social media, go out and do public speaking, create video, create content, and nobody does it. So you have to take a long, hard look at yourself and ask, what am I waiting for? Why aren't I doing this? Usually the answer is because I don't know what to say. So I'm going to give you a tip. I was in the same place of mine. Now, how many of you guys collect images on Pinterest or, or have a swipe file, like a folder, where you just drag cool, inspirational things into? Or you, know, you use iPhoto, you have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 images. Here's one thing that I do. I just go in my photo bucket, like, huh. That's an interesting photo. What can I write about that photo? What kind of caption can I provide that creates value for the people who are looking for me? So writing about food, unless I'm a food blogger and that's how I want to build a career, I don't want to talk about that at all. So let's say I'm a packaging designer. Well, go take photos of great packages and write a little critique. Sooner or later, people that are looking for the foremost expert, the thought leader in packaging design, go up. You know, whenever they have a new logo design, redesign, you know who they call? I almost call, always call the same people. Pentagram design. What do you think about the new X logo? And Michael Beirut will weigh in on it. He's become that guy. I consume content like you cannot believe. I'm usually on my phone watching Game of Thrones and reading a magazine if I can. You know, it's like this. It's crazy. And what I do is if I hear something, if I see something in Time or whatever magazine I'm reading, I stop. I open up Keynote on my iPhone. I type it in. There it is. Boom. I just save it. I kick it out as a PNG or screen cap on my iPhone. And that goes into my Twitter feed whenever it's ready. So I'm doing note taking, social media, micro content continuously all the time. I just look at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as my diary of ideas. That's all it is. And I put that out there. The key here is that you don't always market to your people. That's the problem. Some people are very active on Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, but it's just really marketing all the time. It's like so noisy to me, I don't want to do that. So Gary Vaynerchuk says something like jab, 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 right hook. Give three pieces of content are valuable, then ask for a sale. And be genuine, be open, be transparent about that. Now, if you guys were to grade yourself on a score of 1 to 10, how are you doing in terms of making easy for good clients to find you? What score would you give yourself? I don't expect you to say that out loud, but just think about it. I know it's not going to be a 9 or a 10. You would not be here right now. It'd probably be really low. So let's work on it. I'm going to tell you one other way to generate leads that's worked well is I like to market to marketers. Okay, Why? Because marketers want to sell, and they need design. And they understand they need great images, great campaigns, 
They need video because they want to sell something. So something that's worked for me twice now, and I assume it should work for you too, is when you, something pops up in, in your inbox, let's say like, you know, um, like skincare, right? Like there's like a, a skin care center that I've been to, they give me a little treatment, you know, I had a scab or something, they market to me now. They're like, hey, come in for a rejuvenation thing. You know who I should market to? I should market to them. Next time I come to the doctor's office, I said, you know, I get your emails. Are they performing the way, what's your conversion ratio? I'm just curious, what's your open rate? You know, say something like, like you know what you're talking about. Okay, just fake it, you know? Watch a video or two on that kind of stuff. And like, you know, oh gosh, well what percentage of your business are you generating through um, direct, not direct mail, but uh, through the email blast? Oh, it's like 0.5. Well, that's a little bit below the norm. The norm is like 2%. What can we do to help you? And that's your new business. It works, guys, because they want to sell. They're already actively participating in that, okay? Another thing that you can do is you can friend, follow, whatever social media channel of your choice and establish a dialogue with whoever's running the social media thing. Now, chances are, you don't know the CEO, the CMO, the CRO, the C-suite executives, you don't know them, okay? So since you don't know them, you don't know if, I don't know if you realize this, but they don't manage their social media channel. Usually it's some young person. It's like, oh yeah, I use Snapchat, I can do this. They're much more likely to have a conversation with you and bring it up the chain. Let's look at it like this. When you see a piece of content on the internet, what do you respond to yourself? Something that entertains you, something that teaches you something. And that's what Google said, advertising is dead. In the future, all people care about are two things. Entertain me and inform me. Teach me something. Now, here's one thing. You guys know about content marketing, right? Content marketing, and then there's micro content marketing, micro content, which is you just take a big pizza, you pull the pepperoni off, and you sell that to somebody. Then you take the crust, and you scrape the cheese, you break up this big old thing, and just make it like these bite-sized snackable pieces of content. So if you write a long article that's got seven points in it, you just block it off as tip one, and you just put it out there, okay? And then you turn that tip into a graphic. And you take the whole seven points, and you make an infographic. It's the same piece of content reprocessed for the audience that wants to see it. So if you have, uh, my five hacks for social media on Twitter. A lot of you guys in here are graphic designers. You can probably make a really beautiful piece of design and infographic that will get you noticed and make sure it backlinks your site, that you got all the meta tags in there, and then break that up. You put your image up, you edit all the crap. Just get rid of all the dog photos, and if you don't want to be a dog groomer, don't put the dog photos in there. Edit out your channel, okay? The reason why you follow somebody on Instagram is you look for consistency. Seven, 10, 12, 15 posts of similar things, I'll follow you, okay? People that post all sorts of things like a toy, this and that, it's like I don't, I don't follow them on, on Instagram. You have to be a master at the hashtag game. You have to be a master of the hashtag game. So you test the hashtag just like you test the titles in YouTube. Put in your hashtag, see what comes up, if they're like the people you wanna be like, if you push out eight or nine pieces of consistent content, you will start to be discovered for that thing. Now we have a friend, her name is Tuna Bora. She's up to what, 40, 70,000 followers? She does one watercolor painting a day forever. She's been super consistent. And her followers are going through the roof. You know the, that guy, uh, Seb Lester, the calligraphy guy? He does one thing. He's not showing you how to juggle. He doesn't play video games. He's just a really good calligrapher. And so he has over a million followers on Instagram. So think about what your, your vertical is. Own it, hashtag it, keyword that. It's consistent, right? We're gonna keep doing that thing over and over again. And from what I understand, I don't do this myself. I need to do it. Email marketing is still very effective, relatively speaking. You need to start capturing emails addresses right now if you haven't done so. So how and why would anybody ever give you their email address? Why would they do that? Well, they're not gonna give you their email address because they know you're gonna spam them. So what you have to do is you have to provide something of value to them. It's an exchange. I remember when I was new to shooting video, I went to, um, what is that uh, site? Nofilmschool.com. And No Film School has a little thing, looks like a book, it says No Film School DSLR Shooting Guide. You wanna download the guide? Put in your email address. 
I put in my email address, fine. And I get their newsletter. It doesn't come too often, so I'm not annoyed by it. And they're a news site, so I'm okay to see that. But if you keep hitting me with sales and sales, I will drop you, okay? So that's what they do. So what you want to do is provide a piece of content that's valuable to them and capture emails and build it up. The other thing that you know, need to do, and I don't do, but I've heard this, I've, I've gone to seminars on this, is you need to segment your email list as, as best as possible in many ways so that you can just target. Targeting is really important, either for ads or for uh, whatever else that you're doing. Okay, so these people um, are in this age group or in this industry so that when you need to hit them with something, you're not sending out a mass email to everybody, just to the people that need to see it. When it comes to social media, you have to actually care. It's not like in Google, you can set up your keywords on your ad and you leave it alone. You can't just post an image and be like, I hope 20 people like it. Like, you have to actually care or don't even bother. Like, if you don't care about your community, if you're not liking your followers stuff, you, you, it's like you have to be genuine and you have to be authentic or don't even do it. If you're not tweeting with other people, why are they going to do it with you? So, and it, you're in it for the long haul. Like, that's how I've done it. I don't have millions of followers, but my engagement is much higher than Incredible. The, big, the bigger brands because I care about my followers. But, like, for me, what I do is a lot of film. So, when I put film on there, it's kind of like always consistent of what I do and and stuff like that. So I get people to engage and I love doing it. It's so fun. I'm like almost like every day I want to just put stuff out there and communicate and talk to people. So I think you have to really enjoy social. Like if you hate doing, talking to other people, it's not gonna be fun for you. And also for the hashtag thing, like I just copy other people who's doing really well. That's, not, then, that's what you're supposed to do. And then put, put it into your notes and you can copy it every single time. Yeah. yeah. You keep, yeah, that's right. You know when you say when you put it into your notes, like Evernote or something, so it's easy, you don't have to type it up again. So if you have three or four hashtags that you're gonna include in the comment, just copy it, okay? Yeah, I put it on my Google Drive, sorry. Yeah. But also, like, if you do, like, when I do photography, I'll tag um, brands that like, I've shot with, like I've shot like um, fashion brands, and I'll tag them, and then sometimes they'll pick it up and they'll put it on their Instagram. And I've, I've done that for a few, and they've gotten like 20, 30,000 likes, but you know, that's how you get your name out there instead of Instagram. Guys, in case you're thinking, this sucks, this is stupid, it takes up too much time, I'm not like that, well, if you like what you have, just keep doing it. If you like the results you have right now, just keep doing it, okay? I know it's not fun for some, but over time, you start to learn how to do it, and then you get these followers, and then things start to grow and happen. Then you're like, okay, I like this now. You just don't like the results right now. And it does take work. It's like eating right and exercise. It does take work. Okay. Uh, Frank's strange question, how important is being transparent on social media? I'm a fan of transparency. Everybody like, lives, likes to live this kind of very curated life and everything's so perfect all the time. I think people learn just as much from their mistakes as from their success. And if you write it in a genuine way and tell a story, then people are gonna find value in that. One other thing that Carrie shared with me about Instagram from our expert is that think of your posts as a sequence kind of an editorial sequence. Think about the story it's telling frame after frame as somebody scans through. So if you're gonna talk about, um, say, I don't know, like film noir lighting, don't go from film noir to like techno color to something else and come back to film noir. Kind of make it like a serialized piece of content. Think about it over seven, eight frames, okay? Is there something else you were thinking about, Frank, about transparency? Um, no, it's just, I'll like it's it's a very sensitive topic for me I think being transparent on social media it's very like um, I guess I'm just not used to it but recently I've been more transparent and I think just be trying it and seeing the feedback and um, talking to your friends and community it just feels a lot better I think I was just definitely afraid of that first well, like, initial step right let's talk about transparency for a second I'm all about full transparency except for when it hurts somebody else and it's not respecting somebody else's rights or if it's something that is not really creating any value for anybody. So if something bad happens to you, like you lose a job, I don't want to see you crying about losing a job. But what I'd like to see is, what's that? You want to see it? No, I yeah, right? Oh, you do? <laughs> it's like, yeah, let me see it. There's a darker side to me. No, what I was going to say is that if you lose a job and you're sad about it, say, you know what? 
I lost a job today. I'm not going to whine about it. Here's what I did wrong. And then you enroll more people. That's it. OK? Like recently, I put something on Instagram. I got a, a, a lot of comments and, uh, from kind of offline things. And I talked about the struggle for me to do public speaking. And it's genuine. It's real. All right, so moving on. How to sell things to clients that they didn't know that they need or want. OK. That's supposed to be not two people like high-fiving each other. It's an arm wrestle, just to be clear. All right, they're arm wrestling. How to sell something. Here's the thing. I love this question. I hate this question. I love it because it tells me exactly what you're thinking. And I hate it because the word sell is in there. To me, when you're selling, you're convincing people of something. And nobody likes to be sold to. I mean, if you like to be sold to, you're crazy. You know, you go to a retail store, like, hey, can you try, you know, no, just can I just walk over there and you leave me alone, right? And the, the classic image of the car salesman, the used car salesman a lot, you're being sold something and it feels very artificial. And there's a thing, and I've done this, uh, I've talked about this before, which is if you try to sell somebody and you keep saying all these things, people don't believe you. Sell me something. Tell me about you, how great you are, Frank, since you have the mic. Go ahead, sell me. Um, I'm awesome. No, you're not. <laughs> Keep going. That's so messed up right there. Keep going. <laughs> so my confidence went from like 100 to like zero. <laughs> you're like, now you don't want to say anything. Yeah, okay, it's fine. What do I it's fine. Say now? <laughs> See, the thing is, we just don't believe you. So, I, okay, so look, check this out. I, you know, I, I did this talk in Bratislava, and somebody said something back to me, and like, it totally messed me up. You know. Because they're like, we don't understand this thing, right? So what I said to her is like, when, you're, when you do the talking, you're selling. When they say it, they believe it, and you're closing. You're going to get the business. You need them to think what it is that you are trying to, to convey, all right? So one woman nodding is like, I don't understand that concept. I don't understand that concept. I say, OK, what if I just told you, uh, trust me, I'm a great lover? What do you say to that? She goes, well, let's find out. I'm like, whoa, uh, look, talk to me later. No. So the thing is, I said, no, but in America, if I say, trust me, I already don't trust you. I'm a great lover. No, you're not. No great lover talks about themselves like that, right? So I don't like this idea of selling, especially if they don't need or want it. So what I want to do is to try to surface any kind of challenges or pain points that they're having and see if I can connect them with a solution. Sometimes I'm part of that solution, sometimes I'm not. So we talk, we talk, we talk, and then I find out, oh my gosh, uh, they're, they're dissatisfied with the way their three, 3D renders look, let's just say. It doesn't represent the product in its highest form, and they're a high-end company. They need to present themselves like that, right? I don't do 3D, but if I hear that, I'm like, you know what? I have a network of 3D artists. There's this sketchy guy. His name is Frank. He talks about himself as being awesome. He really is, actually. Why don't you work with him? I can connect you two. You know what happens then, usually? OK, so one is you build trust and rapport. I trust you, there's rapport, and trust is very valuable. It's much more valuable than trying to ask for the sale in the moment. A person I trust, I'm going to call many times. Usually when I do that, this almost always happens. I said, you know what? I don't think you should do this. You know what? You, you, you should spend less money and go with that person. They then insist that you must be the person that they're ready to spend the money. This idea that selling something that somebody doesn't want, I think, is an antiquated idea. You're not that good. You're not Jordan Belfort. He'll sell something to anybody. You know, he uses high pressure sales technique, and people usually have buyer's remorse afterwards. It's not the kind of relationship you want. Yeah. I think the question is rooted in um, like a client comes to you and say, hey, I need a new website. When in actuality, they have a pain point that goes beyond their website. They think it's the website, and you are trying to sell them quote or pit, you know, whatever. Uh, strategy is really what they need or right. something else. So I think that's what the real question is. How do you educate the client of what the real need is rather than what they th may think the need is? How, how many of you guys have said to yourself or heard somebody tell you, a mentor of yours, somebody that you respect, you got to educate the client? How many have either said it, done it, or heard that expression, right? Almost everybody. I don't know who said that before, but I think the interpretation of that and how it turns into action is really messed up. This is usually how I feel about this. Well, let me tell you why you need this. And you start to lecture me. You just get on my face. Just like Frank telling me he's awesome. 
Just get out of my face, okay? Because it's condescending. I had a young girl who came here who worked for me. She was really an incredible designer. She came to me and said, Chris, I'm trying to save your business, but you won't listen to me. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's like fingernail on a chalkboard, you know? Like, you just got out of school. Do you know anything? Do you know, tell me, what, uh, you know, tell me how, how to read a profit and loss statement. What do you mean you're trying to say? My company doesn't need to be saved. Now, it might be, we might be in dire need of that, but it, it doesn't help that somebody's coming at you really hard at that. It just doesn't work. Trust me, I've tried it with my wife many times. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Get on my face, usually. Okay? So let's talk about this term, educate. Okay? If you look at the root, root word educe, it means to draw out. I'm not trying to push something in. I'm just trying to draw out what you need. So in a situation like that, when they come to you and say, I need a website, all you have to do is ask lots of questions. Be genuinely curious. Why do you need a website? Well, everybody has a website. OK, let's say that that's true. But what is it going to do for your business? Well, I, I need to sell more widgets. OK, so let me understand then your customers a little bit better. So do your customers go to your site? Well, I don't know that. How old are your customers? What are their pain points? What are their needs? What are their challenges? And I learn about that. And once I learn about that, then we realize your customers spend very little time on your site, but they do spend a lot of time watching these videos that you've made. Now, all things being equal, would it be better for us to spend $20,000 rebuilding your website or $20,000 making more video content for you. So then I'm going to figure out what it is. I'm drawing it out. Okay, That's the critical part. If you come into it thinking in every conversation, I'm going to sell strategy, I'm going to sell a logo, I'm going to sell uh, a brand for a creative business, that's all you're going to do. So if you have one tool, like a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's not the way you service your clients. Okay. You're much smarter. You're much more versatile than that. And I think it comes out of our own insecurity that we just want to focus on the one thing that we were good at. Remember before when I was telling you that the clients come to us and they ask us things about you know, whatever it is, and I say, we're not the right players? They just wind up hiring us to do all that stuff. The first time I did an identity design for this company called Trojan Storage, the client said to me, his name is Brett. He's a really great client, Brett. Great client. He said, I love working with you. I know you like architecture. John tells me you love architecture. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'm kind of frustrated with what's going on right now. Could you help me design the facade to our buildings? Yes, I can do that. And Brett, you, you know I'm not an architect. He goes, yeah, Chris, I do know that. I'm not stupid. I know that. So what I'll do is I'll hire a local architect, and part of the deal is you take creative direction from Chris. This is freaking awesome. Anybody here an architect? Anybody? No. Being an architect sucks. You don't make any money. In the first several years, you draw bathrooms. You draw fasteners to the walls, like joists and beams. That's all you get to draw. I get to skip all that, do the fun, cool visualization and the storytelling with the images, and somebody else has to do that work. How brilliant is that? That's pretty awesome. It's because I developed trust, and they're going to come to me for a lot more. And I'm open, I'm honest, and I did, you know, I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. And it works out pretty well. I'm just open, OK? I'll build you an app. I'll build you a piece of furniture. I'll design it for you. If you trust me, we'll do it. But I don't want to go in there thinking, I need to sell you a website or architecture or anything else. That's the difference, Sean. OK, is that cool? All right, cool. Does cold calling, emailing work? I don't know if you can tell if this photograph gives it away or not. If so, what are some of the tips and tricks? I've done three cold calls in my life, all in year one, and it did not work. So maybe I, I wasn't as persistent as I should have been. But I find that when you cold call, people become really numb to that. It's like, you're not qualified. I don't know who you are, why you hit me up. The timing is bad. Remember, keep it in the family. Reciprocity. Well, you haven't done anything for me. Why would I do anything for you? 
We would rather hire a friend that would do a worse job than to hire a stranger sometimes that would do a better job just because we know that person and we'd like to help people out. Cold calling does not work. Cold emailing, same thing. It doesn't work. There's a warm lead versus a cold lead. A warm lead is somebody's already expressed some interest in you. And what is that? Like, one thing that you can do is you can look at the people that are looking at you on LinkedIn, the people that are looking at you on using Wistia, because you can track all these things, and I would reach out to them. They've already expressed interest in you. And we, we actually wound up doing that Sony job. Remember how we flew to San Fran, Matt? That's because somebody had just friended me on LinkedIn. And I reached out to him almost immediately and said, I'm glad to connect with you. Is there anything I can do to help? So when people express interest in you, follow up with it. And that's how you can do it. It's called social prospecting. You know, you look at who's looking at you and you reach out to them. And don't write some freaking long email. Don't do it. I don't have a lot of time. They don't have a lot of time. The people that are going to hire you are more successful than you. That means they have less time than you. Don't write a long email. Here's a tip. Look in your inbox. Which ones did you read? Screen capture all those. Put it in my hot box. Look at their subject line. Look at their lead sentence. They almost talk to you like they know you. And there's something of value to you, and they get to it right away. The ones that look like this much copy, I just hit delete. How to sell strategy to clients from a production standpoint. So you guys don't know this, but Frank does some really incredible 3D modeling animation, right? Visual effects work. He and I, we're, we're kind of in a similar place within the food chain of production. We're at the bottom. There's only one layer that's lower than us in terms of decisions being made, and I think it's probably like the colorist or something. It's like, or no, I'm sorry, the sound person is like, he, you know, we fall, we hit the colorist, and the colorist falls, and he hits the sound design guy, and just, we're really at the bottom. So now we want to get to the top. Like, how do we get to the top? So before I was saying, don't sell your clients anything. I'm going to give you some more nuanced language on how to deal with this. A client will come to us 90% of the time because they want us to produce a video for them. So I'm in the same boat as you. How do we get them from being here to talk to us about a video to talking about something else? So we have to do a little dance. We have to slowly move with them and point them in a different direction. Uh, I refer to it as embracing and then pivoting, OK? It's not a sell, because the sell is a punch. I want to embrace, and I want to move them to the side a little bit. How do we do that? Somebody comes in, Chris loved the work. We saw this in this spot. We saw Ancestry.com. We're really happy, blah, blah, blah. So that's great. That's great. That's the embrace. Appreciate you coming out to find us, to hear about this. I'm glad you like our work. That's great. But I'm doing something new with my practice, something I've been doing in the last two and a half years. And I find that if I can sit down with my clients, understand who their customers are, what their challenges and their pain points are, I can better service you. Can we spend 30 minutes talking about this? Here comes the pivot. Yeah. And generally speaking, when I do this for my clients, they find it to be very valuable. This is my, my pitch here, OK? They tend to find it very valuable. Like, yeah, I got 30 minutes. Let's do this. So I say, well, tell me who your customers are. Tell me what your sales channels are. Tell me how you're doing business. I want to understand that. What do you think their needs are? And we go through this. And this is part of what we teach in core. We draw out what their needs are. We draw out what their pain points are. And through that, by the end of the conversation, we're no longer talking about a video. Like, you know what? You need to do the brand strategy deck for us. I'm like, OK, great. I forgot to tell you one other thing that I say. Because I want to start planting the seed that what I'm doing is valuable and not free. Okay? Designers, creative types, feel guilty to be paid for talking and thinking. When's the last time you charge money to talk and think? Right. Well, you can only charge if we're on the box. As soon as we get off and the clients ask us, what should I do with this or that? We're not on the clock anymore. Now, attorneys don't work that way. Consultants don't work that way. But designers work that way. I forgot the one last little bit in that exchange of embracing and pivoting is to say something like this. Now, typically, I charge ten to $20,000 to do discovery and strategy. This first half an hour is free. It's on me. I want you to see what I can do. If you find it to be valuable, let's talk about engagement later on. But I don't want to talk about money right now. 
I just want to see if I can figure out something with you. That's it. So now they're thinking, OK, you know, when you meet with a, a financial advisor, an attorney, the first meeting is always free. So I use that language. After that, it's on you. First one's on me, second one's on you. Now, one last little nuance bit I'm going to add to this so that you guys know how I do it. Is more often than not, if I'm sitting there talking to the CEO or somebody important within the company, they're, they're too small, right? A big company has many layers to get through. So after we're done, they're sitting there thinking, this is wonderful. You helped me understand something about my business and my customers I've never understood before. That's valuable to me. I say, OK, that's great. So here's my problem. If I were to charge you my normal rate, I don't think you can afford it based on what I figured out about your company already. Based on your revenue, based on your margins, you can't afford this. But I am open to some kind of alternative compensation model. You guys know what that means? Alternative compensation model? Barter. Barter. Anything that's not a direct money exchange for services. Typically, how I like to structure it is, if you pay me my hard costs, so I don't go out of pocket, because I have to hire people, everything else is negotiable. If it's a tech company, I could do equity. If it's a product, I could do uh, products in exchange for services, or I can do a revenue share. So for every unit that's sold that I help you move, I make a percentage of sale. This is freaking awesome. It is the holy grail of what it is that we do in the service industry to be making money while we sleep. Would you like to do that? I've done these deals. It's freaking awesome. It is really awesome. Alternative compensation model. Business people understand that language. So what I do is I don't ask for what that payment is. I let them figure it out. Because generally speaking, they're going to be more generous to me than I would be to myself. So then I say, well, what makes sense to you based on what you saw here? Hmm. Why don't we give you a, a ref share? What does ref share mean to you? 50%. After expenses, you get 50%. I like that. I was going to ask for 15. I let them do it, because I'm going to negotiate them up, if need be.